Good morning and welcome to Beacon Church. My name is Christian Campbell and I'm glad to have you online worshiping with us. We have Beacon Life coming up on Sunday, October 16th after our 1030 service here at the YMCA. If you're new to Beacon or just want to get more involved, this is the next step for you and we encourage you to join us. We will talk about ways to go deeper, get involved with our Beacon community, joining a Beacon team, and other volunteer opportunities to serve our community. Sign up online to join us. We also have a family event happening on Saturday, October 22nd at Elwood Orchards. We will meet up and enjoy the fall afternoon at the orchard together. Tickets for the corn maze are for purchase and we will buy tickets on site. Elwood also offers a free hayride and fall snacks for purchase. We invite you to come out and join us at Elwood Orchards at 2 p.m. on October 22nd. Today we continue in our Imagine series through Ephesians chapter 3. Thanks for watching with us online. We pray you are encouraged by this message and new series. Well, did you know that in recent surveys, they found that one in three Americans admit to lying on their resume? So statistically speaking, if you're sitting next to two people either side, that means one of you three lied on your resume, statistically speaking. Now, don't point fingers. Don't try and figure out who. Well, that means there's quite a few liars in this room this morning uh, when it comes to statistics and resumes. But it's interesting, right? People like to, they said, exaggerate on resumes. People like to kind of exaggerate how long they were at a business or how, how the results were when they worked there. Because we all like to think that when I worked there, the company was great, everything flowed smoothly, and output, oh man, it was the best it's ever been. That's how we think, right? But one in three lie. It, it's pretty crazy to think about. I've been a part of multiple hires in my life, and, and what I've realized is when, when you meet someone, you can't really tell much about them just from a resume. I mean, you can tell what they've done in their life. Yeah, okay, you've worked there, you've done this. And, and if there's big gaps in a resume, you know to ask questions and dig a little deeper, right? What, what did you do for those six months? But when it comes down to really getting to know someone, that's where the interview comes in. The references come in. That's, that's where you, you actually need to talk to someone. You can't just see what they look like on paper to know who they are. And, and, and I think when you ask people, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to live like a Christian? I, I found when you ask that question of people, they start to list out things that you do. Oh, being a Christian? Oh, to me, being a Christian means going to church. It means reading your Bible. It means praying. It means tithing. It means like doing these things. Now, don't get me wrong. That's not, that's not bad, right? If you're a Christian, you don't read your Bible. If you don't go to church, like you, you should do those things. But I think... That that's a shallow version of what it means to be a Christian. I think there's so much more depth. When you're asked the question, what does it mean for you to be a Christian, to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the guy that died on the cross for you so that you could have everlasting life? I think it's a little more than just a list of things that we do. What do you think? What does it mean to be a Christian, a Christ follower, I want you to hear this today. God is concerned with who you're becoming more than what you be doing. Now, that's a cheesy pun. I'm sorry. My wife was the only one that laughed at that joke. Thanks, guys. That's like saying my mom says I'm really good at the sport. It's, uh, it's mandatory, right? But, but I think that the truth still stands that, that God does care about what we do. He cares about our actions. Absolutely. I'm not saying that. Don't walk away today saying, I can do whatever I want. God doesn't care. He, he does. But more than our actions, I think God wants our hearts. That's what he cares about. If you were to examine yourself today and, and your heart, how's it looking? A little heart checkup. 
You do annual physicals and checkups, right? And you got to go and, and get hooked up to machines and do all this different stuff, blood tests and different things. But, but how is your heart today when it comes to Jesus? You are on the verge of a heart attack? Your, your blood pressure out through the roof? Or, or are you pretty calm today? Jesus, he cares about our hearts. But John Piper puts it this way. He says, this is a quote from one of his messages. Realize that the New Testament portrays some responses of the soul as roots and hundreds of others as fruits of obedience. Some acts are roots, some are fruits. So we should focus on the deepening and strengthening and the intensifying of roots like hope, faith, and love. Each one of those in the New Testament is pictured as producing life. What we do in our life matters, our action matters, but God, I mean, he cares about our hearts. Do you have a faith that is rooted in love? Quite often when we think about, okay, we're, we, we want to know what should we do as a Christian, and, and we start thinking about all the fruits, all the actions, all the obedience, and, and again, that is good, but, but do we focus on who Jesus is and what he means to us, our internal roots? The depths of the love of who Jesus is, who he calls us to be. What it means to be a Christian is more than just, I don't know, going to church. And yet, most people would say that good Christians, if you're really a good Christian, then you make sure you go to church and that's what matters. I think there's more to it than that. We're in week two of our Imagine series. And we're asking God, we're saying, God, what are you calling us as Christians and and as a church to be? What's your call on our lives? And our memory verse is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. And and so let's put it up on the screens and let's go ahead and read it out loud together. It goes like this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So last week, uh, I held up a piece of paper and I said, if this is your life, your calling, what would you write on it? What do you think God is calling you to look like today as a Christian, as a believer, and as a church? And and what we came to was the conclusion that that last week, the thing that we can do is write our name at the top of the piece of paper. Like when you you draw a drawing at school and teacher writes your name up top. But when we write our name, we realize that we could write chosen son or daughter. Not just Calvin Daly as my name, but, but chosen son of God. And, and then we also looked at how, how to approach God in prayer. We looked at how our identity is found in Jesus and, and what it means to live up to the name that we have in Christ. What it means to be a Christian and, and the importance of prayer. So, so today, as we look and work towards what to do what God is calling us as a church to do. I first want to look at Paul's prayer as he helps us understand how we're called to live. And in this, he wants us to know not just what we need to do as Christians, but, but who we need to become. The identity that we have in Christ and, and the virtues, the values of what it means to live a certain way. So our identity is found in Jesus is what we talked about last week. Our calling is to live for Jesus But today, I think we'll see that power to live for Jesus comes from the power of Jesus. So we're in chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 16, and it goes like this. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. There's an emphasis here on what Paul's talking about, his prayer for the Ephesian church. This, this new church had come about, and it was filled with Gentiles, with Jews. There was this national racial divide, and yet they were coming together, united as one church. As we think about churches today, there, there should be this unity that comes. No matter where you're from, no matter what race you are, what ethnicity you are, what nationality you are, we should be able to come under the umbrella of who Jesus is and be one church, right? And that's Paul's prayer for these people. But he knows that being a quote-unquote good Christian doesn't just happen by trying harder. It doesn't just happen if we say, okay, well, I kind of figured a few things out. If I just go as fast as I can, run hard at it, then then I'm going to get better at it. I put in the hours, put in the work, then I'm going to be good. What he's saying is don't fall into that fallacy that simply working harder, trying harder means you'll accomplish more. But know that true power comes from Jesus. He brings us back to to this focus, which is Jesus. It's really easy to get distracted these days. Have you you ever been distracted by something? I 
I quite often will work in, in a coffee shop because we don't have offices yet. We're looking for office space and figuring out that as a church. But, but I'll work in an office space and I'll put my headphones in. I'll be working. And, uh, uh, but my wife will tell you that I'm not allowed to sit facing where everybody else is because if I do that, she knows I'm not going to be paying attention to her. And so I'll be sitting there and people walk in and as soon as movement happens, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what they're doing. I just go, okay. Every two seconds, I'm looking up and getting distracted. It's easy to get distracted, right? It's easy to, to fall away from how we're supposed to be. And, and, and Paul, he's saying, in this, the, the Christian life, how I'm calling you to live, how Jesus is calling you to live, comes by looking at him. The distractions of our world can be overwhelming. But when you look at Jesus, that's where you'll find power. This is his prayer. He's saying, I want you to be spiritually strong. And that strength comes from the knowledge of who Jesus is. And in, in a minute, we'll see about how it comes from the, the essence and the spirit of Jesus within us. But our power cannot just come from ourselves. We like to think that we're, we're pretty strong, right? I, I got this. I'm an independent person. I'm able to, to pave my way and make a name for myself. And this is where the gospel really makes a rub against what it means to be a Christian for us. Because because most of us are brought up in a certain way that says you need to be independent. You need to work hard. Pull up your bootstraps. If you work hard, you'll be successful, you'll achieve, and and you'll be comfortable, and you'll, you'll have everything that you need. And yet the gospel comes in and Jesus says, well, you can try that and maybe you'll have some success in life. But when it comes to being a Christian, it's all about me. We can't just work harder. We need to live spiritually strong. Paul's making three asks, three, three prayers to God for the Ephesian church. And there's three things that we can learn for us today. In this, we, we want to kind of call our message today, making the ask. That's what Paul's doing here. He, in prayer, he's coming before God and he's making the ask of God for, for these Christians, for this church. And in verse 16, we see, out of his glorious riches, may he strengthen you feel strong today? May he strengthen you. Well, with power through his spirit in your inner being. What does it mean to have inner strength? You ever thought about that? To be spiritually strong. Do you ever find that uh, it's easier to be spiritually strong when you go to church? You ever find that? And then you have to do this thing called going out into the normal world in your work week (laughs) and, and, and being around all those heathens who don't act a certain way. And yet, we become like them, and we're no different. When it comes to spiritual strength, it is so much harder when, when you're out in the world and, and you feel like, well, how am I supposed to be different when everybody else acts a certain way? I don't want to stick out. I'll be made fun of. I'll, it's, it's hard to, to be different in a world that wants you to be like them. How do you do it? You ever struggle with that? Maybe you're at work and... And, and, and you're on lunch break and everybody else is sitting there and, and the, the clock's ticking by and you get 30 minutes. And at 31 minutes, you start packing your stuff up and you notice nobody else is. Well, what do you do? Do you sit there? It's easy to do that, right? To sit there while everyone else, I mean, I work with all these people and then 35 minutes, you're like, uh, okay, I guess we're going to have a long lunch today. Then 38 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. How long before you go back to work? Because... Everybody else is sitting there, so why do I have to go do all the work? It's easy to fall away and compromise when we're not sitting, standing with our our spiritually strong Christian friends, right? But in reality, a long lunch means you're stealing from your business, right? Stealing from the boss. You're being paid to work, and yet we do that all the time, but we we just rationalize it, say, well, everyone else is doing it. Um... I, I coach soccer, and, and quite often I'll, I'll ask the kids, they'll say, well, everyone else is doing that. And I'll say, well, if everybody else was running into a brick wall, would you run into it too? And there's always one joker that says yes. <laughs> but they wouldn't. But it's hard when we, when we leave the confines, the, the strength of, of being together as a church and go into our everyday life, it's hard not to compromise. And this is what Paul knows, and he's saying we need to live spiritually strong. He's not talking about physical strength. It's good. In other chapters in the Bible, he talks about physical strength. But he's talking about inner spiritual strength. 
being able to live for Jesus even when you're not around other people who are living for Jesus. Maybe it happens at school. Oh, school's a tough place. I don't envy kids at school. You're at school and you're there and someone's being picked on. Oh, sometimes it's hard not to jump on that bandwagon, right? Everybody's making fun of the other kid and, and you don't want it to change because if you don't make fun of them, maybe they'll start making fun of you and you just start getting into what all the other kids are doing. It's tough. It even happens with our friends when we go out, right? You're going out, you're having a good time and, and then your friends stay for that extra drink after they shouldn't. And they're like, where are you going? What are you doing? You feel peer pressured and, 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 and you, you want to go home, you know you shouldn't and yet sometimes it's hard when you're, you're spiritually weak, when you're inwardly weak not to take part in things you know you're not supposed to do and and paul he's encouraging this church these believers he's he's trying to build them up and he's saying you need to live spiritually strong are you spiritually strong today what does it mean to live spiritually strong being able to survive the temptations of our world and and to make a stance for who jesus calls you to be some people, I feel like they're, they're really good at doing this and I admire them. When they're in, no matter what situation they're in, they are who they're called to be and who Jesus wants them to be. And I strive towards that. In Romans 12, verse 2, it's a famous verse. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So how can we be spiritually strong today? What does it look like to be strong when it comes to our faith? Well, I think when we're going out into the world, one of the hard parts is we're not around other Christians who can support us. And so if we know all power comes from Jesus, then first and foremost, we need to come to him in prayer. That gets busy, right? Your day ever get busy? You ever go through a day and you're like, ah, I didn't pray today. And, and, and we kind of get into the motions of doing work. And, but I think coming to, to God and spending time in prayer, asking other people to pray for us when we know that day is going to be difficult, that's powerful. Now, prayer is a tricky thing because quite often people are like, okay, but, but I'll pray, but what do I need to actually do? Because we belittle the power of prayer, right? But prayer is so powerful. Out of prayer, we go to the person that can provide endless, limitless things for us, the creator of our world, and yet we're like quite often, yeah, 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 I'll pray if I need to, but, but what can I do? Paul's saying, pray. Grow spiritually strong through prayer. Create positive guardrails in your life. If you struggle with certain things, strength, maturity, people who have that put guardrails in their life, right? A mature, faithful husband puts guardrails in his life and makes sure that he doesn't go in places that he shouldn't go. So he's not tempted. A a spiritually mature, strong person makes sure that they they put these things in place that are safety nets to stop them from doing what they're not supposed to do. Maybe even we can memorize some of our scriptures so that when we come to those moments of of temptation, of, of stress, of the heaviness of life, we can remind ourselves of the promises that God has for us. Now, maybe you don't have a job where You can sit down and crack open your Bible for 30 minutes while you're working. Most of us don't, right? But you can crack open the Bible in your heart if you've memorized Scripture. You can crack crack open the Bible in your mind where you recite the good news of what Jesus has said. When When we spend time with God, when we spend time in prayer, when we spend time in the Scripture, when we spend time in worship, we're growing in our spiritual strength so that in those moments of testing when we're outside of the church, we can still know who Jesus has called us to live, to be. Now, I, I don't think that being a Christian, our, our faith life, life is, is like a battery. Sometimes we, we live this way where, where we think like, okay, so I'm going to come to church and recharge my battery, my spiritual battery. You ever, ever felt, felt spiritually low, like you're running out of energy and and you just need to come back to church to worship and, and you'll be filled right back up and it's great. Now, now I, I think we do get energized in church, but I don't think our life is like a battery because the truth is we have the spirit of Jesus living within us. If we're a battery, that would mean that my life needs to go plug in, recharge when I come to church and then go out into the work and all the energy goes out. But, but what God's saying, what Paul's saying right here is you have Jesus living within you. That means you're connected to the mains. You don't need a battery. 
You're connected to who I am. My power can flow through you. And, and this is the encouragement because when you, you feel like you're at your wit's end or when you're in, at work or in, in a situation with your family, you can know that you have connection with God, that you can look to Jesus and find power, that you don't have to just, just make do until you can go back to church, find out what to do from there. We have connection to the limitless power of who God is. And so Paul, he's praying that they would be strengthened by the power of the Spirit in their inner being. So Christian living is not running on battery power. It's being connected to Jesus, the mains, the source. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. And and so power to live for Jesus comes from the power of Jesus. He, He really wants us to have an abundance mindset in this. It's pretty easy to get down on life. You ever get down on life? I don't know about you, but recently it feels like the burdens of life just get pretty heavy, and and I feel pretty tired. And and physically it can impact you, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, it impacts all of your being. And, and in those moments when 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 I'm like that, quite often it it kind of feels like maybe God doesn't care quite as much as I thought He did. You ever get that way? And you're wondering, okay, God, why is this going on? And and unfortunately, sometimes my brain can go into this thought process, maybe you can resonate, where where you think, okay, God, if you love me, why wouldn't you let this this happen? Or if you love me, why would you let that happen? And and it gets tricky, it gets tough, and and in those moments, it's it's easy to want to give up. And, And I think here, Paul's encouraging us, he's saying, don't. Don't do that. Don't believe the lies that God doesn't care about you. Because when it comes to who God is, this inner strength, this power that we're connected with that God has for us, we know that that no matter what's going on in life, He loves us. That no matter what we're going through, He's going to be right there with us. That no matter how empty we feel, we have the power source running through us. And so we can just take a breath Come to him and ask. Make the ask. Ask God to provide what he promises. He cares about your daily life. Sometimes we think, yeah, but this is too small. Like, can, can God really care about all these small little things? Yeah. He's huge. He's bigger than we can even understand. It's, it blows my mind to even start to try to understand God. And then sometimes we're like, all right, God, I know you're busy, but can you help me with this? God's not busy. God's always available. You don't have to come to church, say a special prayer, and talk to the pastor in order to connect with God. The beauty of our faith is that Jesus, the power of Jesus, lives in you. This is where where Paul goes on to talk about in Ephesians verse 17, chapter 3, 17. Paul wants you to be spiritually strong. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. My uh, first apartment that I lived in was in Manchester, and it was a two-bedroom apartment in what they what they uh, people like to call uh, not a nice neighborhood in town. And uh, uh, we uh, lived on the I lived on the second floor of the apartment, and it never really felt like home. You ever had that like just that unsettled feel, like you you don't really feel like you are at home. And, and I was thinking about that recently, and, and what I realized was I never really made it home. I didn't really put stuff on the walls very much. It was all secondhand furniture and stuff that people had generously given me. And and it was kind of like, all right, I rent this apartment. I don't own it. I rent it. I have other people's stuff in this apartment. And I just kind of live there. My wife laughed at me because for years, I didn't really have a bed frame. And by didn't really, I didn't. I just had two mattresses (laughs) on the floor. Two little single bed mattresses on top of each other on the floor. Not a bed spring, but a, a box spring, but a, two mattresses. And, and then I got married and things changed. But there's, <laughs> there's certain times in life where you just don't feel settled. Now, maybe physically in your home, you don't feel settled. Or maybe emotionally in life, in a job, in work, with friends. You just, you just have this unsettled feeling in life. And, and as I was thinking about that, and, and what Paul is saying here, he he, he's using this word dwell when it comes to Christ. When he's looking at our inner lives, he's saying, may Christ dwell in your hearts. 
And there's two Greek words that, that are used for the word dwell. One is parakeo, and, and that's kind of like what it felt like for me when I was renting this apartment, because that means inhabit as a stranger. You ever felt a stranger in a certain place? When you go to work and you feel like you don't fit in, you're kind of like the odd person. When, you, when you're in your family and maybe you feel like you, you're not quite the person that fits in, you're in the wrong family and, and you're wondering why God put you in that family. Like sometimes we, we can live that way. But the word that Paul uses here when he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts is pronounced, I'm going to mispronounce this one, katakeo. And this word means to settle down and feel at home. My wife and I, we live in Derry, we bought a house a couple of years ago. And if you walk in that house now, we have picture frames on the wall. We bought new furniture. We, we have the rug that we chose with the lamps that we, well, we is uh, real, we. With the lamps that we chose in the position that we chose. And maybe you have that at home too. We settled. We settled down. We made it a home. And this is what Paul is saying to, to the Ephesian church. This is what he's saying to us today. It, it, it's one thing to know Jesus, to accept Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But it's another thing to let Jesus and his love settle down into your innermost beings. For him to, to know everything about you and, and not to be a stranger in your heart, but to live there. This is the second thing that God is calling us as a church to do, to live with Jesus at home in our hearts. So maybe you're thinking, well, I mean, as a Christian, when you believe in Jesus, then, then everybody has Jesus and the Holy Spirit in their hearts. That's true. There's a famous theologian, Charles Hodges. He says this, the indwelling of Christ is a thing of degrees. So yes, you can be filled with the Spirit. Jesus is in your heart. But what Jesus really wants for you today is not just to receive him in your heart, but to, to allow him to make himself at home there. And there's a difference, right? There's a difference between living for Jesus, but kind of just going through the motions and, and fully living out of the call of Jesus on your life. So the question really is, what would it take to kind of move from a surface level, Jesus in your heart, to Christ settling down into the depths of your inner being? Because if the power of God comes through Jesus, the strength of God in our lives comes through Jesus, then the more Jesus is, we, we allow Jesus to work in and through us, the more settled he is at home in our hearts. This is where power through our lives are going to come, this inner spiritual strength. We uh, um, unfortunately uh, had an incident in our house uh, about a year and a half ago. We, we have this Furbo. Have you ever heard of Furbo? We have a dog and this Furbo is kind of creepy, but it's a camera in your house where if your dog barks, it turns on and you can see what's going on in your house. And so we have one of those and, and uh, my wife and I were out at a restaurant and all of a sudden we just get alert, alert, alert. And we're like, what's going on? Now our minds go, is there an intruder? Is the dog going crazy? Like what, what's going on? And, and we see our dog Molly is just barking and running around the house. She's, she's all freaked out. And we're like, what, what is happening? So eventually we go home and check it out and we couldn't figure it out. It was, it was in the evening, it was dark outside. Um, and then the next morning I get up and realized there's this tree trunk laying next to my house. And I go look, and, and the window is scraped all down, and the siding is scraped all down. A tree had split in half, and the trunk had just smashed at the side of my house. No wonder my dog was going crazy. <laughs> and uh, thankfully, Christian came over with his chainsaw, and, and he's there chopping the tree down so we can chop it into pieces, we can stack the wood, all that stuff. And, and he comes out and he says, hey, come look at this. So I go look at it. And in the middle of the tree trunk, it was all rotted. It was so interesting. The reason why that tree fell down is because its in, insides were rotted. Now, I, I kind of want to ask this question. Are your insides rotted today? When it comes to your heart, if Jesus is living in your heart, if he's dwelling and making his home in your heart, then our heart shouldn't be rotting from the inside out. They should be actively being renewed when Jesus makes his home in our heart, our, our heart should be becoming more like who he is calling us to be on a daily nature. When you allow things of this world to, to infiltrate you, this is what weakens you, right? The things that we put inside of us, what we listen to, what we watch, what we say, what we read, all those things, it, it's kind of like garbage, what we tell our kids, garbage in, garbage out. That just makes you a dump. Nobody wants to be the dump. Like, 
That's what it comes down to when we say, guard your hearts. Paul's saying, I, I want you to be strengthened in your inner being so that, you, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith to be rooted and established in love. When Jesus makes his home in your heart, not just a, a superficial entry level at home, but deep roots, then we, we are connected with him in a whole nother way. He's living through us. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prosperous. As a church, we want to be known. We desire, we think God's call for us, beacon is to be rooted and established in love. And that power, that love, it comes through having Jesus at home in our hearts so that he can work in and through us in our world. So before we even talk about what is God's call on our, our lives as a church to do, I mean, first and foremost, we need to see who he's calling us to be, how he's calling us to live, to live spiritually strong, to live with Jesus at home in our heart. We, we can get so caught up in uh, focusing on what to do that sometimes we can miss the whole point of why God wants us to do it. Maybe you've been at a, a job and, and they're so focused on the bottom line, on, on making a lot of money, that they forget and care, to care about their employees. You ever been in a place like that? Maybe at a church where we can get so focused on, on growing and doing better that we forget about who Jesus really is and the power and love that he has for us. Maybe with your family. Maybe as, as yourself, as you're, you're, you so badly want to be in a relationship with someone that you forget how God calls you to live and you start dating a non-Christian. There's certain ways that, that God calls us to live, our heart. He wants us to be deeply rooted in his ways. And out of that comes the fruit of his goodness. And so I think that, that quite often we need to worry less about the fruit that's coming out of our lives and more about the depths of his love, faith, and hope of how he's calling us to live. So that we can be prepared. Because when you're prepared, as soon as God, have you noticed this? God prepares you. Like, you're like, all right, God, why, why am I going through this? And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's because of this. And then it happens. And then you're so thankful that God had you go through that. This is my prayer for today. I pray that we'd be spiritually strong. I pray that Jesus would make his homes in our hearts so that we'd be rooted and established in love. And, and as we do this, we, we know that he will reveal to us what he wants for us to do. He's preparing us. You ever had to prepare for, for something? Maybe to give a speech, or a message, a race, or a game. You, you know that there's certain things you have to do in order to be prepared so that when the time comes, when the green light goes, the car works. You're ready to go. Our prayer as a church, we, we handed out these, uh, these prayer cards the other week. And on these prayer cards, we're, we're asking God every day, we're saying, God, reveal to me where I need to grow my faith, your truth. Because of the hope found in you, who can I invite to follow Jesus today? And then the, the hope, then the light. Show me how I can share your love today. And, and, and what you can do is you can grab one of these we have in different places. Put it somewhere that you'll see daily and join us in these prayers so that we can prepare for what God has for our church. So that when the time comes, whether it's small or big, we'll be ready. Spiritually strong. With Jesus as the power strengthening us, leading and guiding us into the fullness of what God is calling us to do. This is where we'll close today. It finishes in verse 18 and 19. Being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure with, of all the fullness of God. We can never understand the fullness of God. It, it's a mystery. But in the love of Jesus, we start to see who God is. God is revealing himself to us through who Jesus is and the love that he has for us. And this vastness of what Jesus has done, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, just means that no matter what you've done, 
No matter what's going on in your life today, no matter the heaviness or craziness, you are not too far gone for Jesus to save you. Repent, come to him, ask for forgiveness so that we can live for him. And as we live this way, hearts focus on Jesus, he'll reveal to us what to do. As it says in 1 John 3, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command. I love this. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Power to live for Jesus. It comes from the power of Jesus. Let's pray today. God, we ask today that you would continue to reveal to us where you are are having us grow in our lives. Continue to help us grow more to be like you each and every day. God, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.